ECDC On Air. The podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, my name is Nicholas and I'm your host for today's episode of ECDC On Air, which is the podcast for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Today I have with me in the studio Erik Alm, who is ECDC Principal Expert on Applied Molecular Epidemiology. Nice to have you here on ECDC on air, Eric. Welcome. Thank you, Niklas. It's really nice to be here. So you're here to talk uh, about virus variants and virus mutations. This is a topic which, of course, has been very relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen various different virus mutations, uh, well, for example, Omicron uh, becoming dominant and replacing other variants. Let me just start off asking you a, a basic question. Why do viruses mutate? Um, viruses don't really want to mutate. They, they mutate because of imperfections in uh, their biological systems. That's kind of the fundamental reason why they do that. And I mean, all of evolution is at its core kind of driven by these random mutations as they create the genetic diversity that then uh, the natural selection can act upon and uh, producing more fit uh, organisms overall. Okay, but it seems that the new variants that are becoming dominant, they're, they're always more transmissible. And that's the kind of the reason why they become dominant, right? Is it always like that, that they, they have a competitive advantage over the ones that are less transmissible? Is it correct? Well, viruses that become dominant, they can do so by random chance, but more likely is that they become dominant because they have some kind of competitive advantage compared to other variants. And But what that advantage is can actually be different and uh, at the beginning of the pandemic where basically the population was naive so to say to the virus they have never been exposed to this virus before so everyone was also kind of uh, susceptible to it then the transmissibility was really the main advantage that the virus could have and that means that the more transmissible the virus is the, the higher the likelihood that you will infect other people when you when you have uh, the disease but as the pandemic has moved on more and more people have uh, been exposed to the virus and not only that, but also vaccines have been introduced that also elevate immunity levels in the population. And uh, due to this, uh, it has more and more shifted towards uh, immunoscaping, the most important uh, aspect of uh, the competitive advantage for viruses. So we see now mainly that the viruses are better at evading the immunity that have been acquired through the vaccines or uh, through being infected before or a combination of the two. And that's really what the main driver is now. And it has also become more and more difficult to kind of disentangle these two properties because you cannot really measure directly which of the properties that gives the advantage. You can only observe that the variant is increasing and causing an increase in cases. You cannot really directly say why, even though you can get some indications from, example, from laboratory studies where you try to elucidate how much immune escape a certain variant has, for example. And when we talk about mutations, when we say that a new variant has arisen, how do you actually define that? I guess there are like very minuscule changes all the time. When is it that we say that a new variant has actually appeared? Yeah, that question is actually a lot more complex than uh, you, what you think maybe, because a variant is a very generic way of describing what a genetically distinct group of organisms within a species is. So it can really be anything. So there has to be some kind of definitions. And there are many different ways of uh, describing a genetic group that are a bit more well-defined. And uh, I mean, the history of naming organisms goes way, way back in time to the, to the Swedish botanist Carl von Linné, who, uh, or Carl Linnaeus in English, that kind of defined how you name a species. But back then, no one knew about genetics at all. So it was all based on what you would call the phenotypic traits of an organism. So like how the organism looks or behaves etc. And uh, by examining these properties, then uh, Carl von Linnea gave uh, different organisms different names. Since then, we have learned what genetics is, basically. And in, especially in the last 20 years, the large-scale genetics field genomics have exploded. And now we have a much more exact tool to determine which organisms that are actually related and which are not. Um, so, so the naming system kind of came before understanding the mechanism for, for similarity or dissimilarity between organisms. And when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 in particular, 
there are different naming systems uh, that kind of uh, that use the, the genetic information to name variants. So one that we uh, adopted very quickly at ECDC here is the, the Pango nomenclature, which is developed by a group in the UK. And uh, this nomenclature has names that you might have heard, such as B1617.2. Yeah, cetera. they're all very hard to remember, all these. Uh, I mean, I guess that's why sometimes you also have the, the naming convention that they're called you know, Delta or Gamma or uh, Omicron and so on, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so the B.1.617.2 uh, <laughs> is the Delta variant, uh, and that might be very difficult to remember. So because the system is very comprehensive and very complicated, this Pango uh, nomenclature system, uh, the WHO decided that it was too complicated for um, uh, public communication. So people from the media and the, and the general public had a difficulty kind of uh, keeping these names apart and, and using them correctly and remembering them. So the WHO then started kind of early in 2020 or in the spring of 2021, sorry, uh, started to, to use a naming system based on the Greek alphabet. So alpha, uh, beta, gamma, and so on. And this system actually goes back a little bit to to how Carl von Linnaeus uh, really tried to, to name organisms originally in the uh, 18th century in the way that these letters should ideally be associated with a different phenotype. So you should be able to observe a difference uh, in the virus that also has some kind of impact on uh, the course of the pandemic. So that's how the, that is defined. And that is not really what you normally call a variant in uh, microbiology. A variant can be, as I said, any genetic change at all. It's not really well defined. It can be a single mutation. But a variant in this context means something that is phenotypically different and that we usually actually call a strain in microbiology. So that is a strain is something that is measurably different in terms of how it acts phenotypically, not only differing uh, with some kind of uh, genotypic change. And uh, if we look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is it mutating more than other viruses or is it behaving more or less in the same way as yeah, whatever other virus? So SAR- SARS-CoV-2 is, a, is an RNA virus and uh, RNA viruses are the viruses that generally mutate the fastest of uh, all classes of viruses. There are also viruses that are based on uh, DNA. They tend to mutate a bit slower. But when it as an RNA virus, it's actually kind of slow mutating. And there are some kind of good reasons for that. All coronaviruses actually are very complex viruses for being RNA viruses. They have the largest genome, so the most information encoded in the genome of all RNA viruses, uh, about 30 kilo base pairs or 30,000 base pairs, which maybe sounds small in the world of uh, computers where we have like gigabytes of information on a, on a small flash drive. So, so it's like 30 kilobytes of information or um, yeah, around that order of magnitude. And um, it also has a lot of functions to actually prevent itself from mutating. So normally RNA viruses, they mutate randomly quite a lot, quite quickly. And therefore they generate this kind of big diversity, which you then uh, can apply the natural selection to. But the SARS-CoV-2 virus has mechanisms in its kind of uh, copying machinery of the RNA uh, that prevents it from mutating so rapidly. So it's actually quite a slow uh, mutating virus. Um, However, during the pandemic, we have seen kind of weird effects or weird behaviors in the evolution. We have seen many, many mutations accumulating suddenly with no kind of intermediate stage found uh, anywhere in the population, which is generally quite unusual for viruses that spread just within the human population. I mean, that is more what you would expect for a virus that often transmits between humans and animals, for example where you have a lot of uh, undetected mutations uh, that you don't see in the animal populations. And then suddenly you get an introduction to the human population and then you see kind of a new variant emerging all of a sudden. But that doesn't really seem to be happening with SARS-CoV-2. It's rather that somehow in the human population it has uh, at several uh, points in time accumulated a large number of mutations all of a sudden. Or maybe at least it has not been detected at the intermediate stages and then... uh, and, and that's how generally how these, uh, these new variants that, that have different phenotypic traits that have been named using WHO system, that's how they have arisen, basically. Mm-hmm. So is it bad news when a virus mutates necessarily? I guess it's a, it's a kind of a natural process that will happen inevitably. But uh, if they do these kind of sudden jumps, like you described, is that worse for human health or 
How would you say? It is, it is potentially worse. Um, so the virus generally changes in small increments. So like a single change in, is introduced. And most of these changes are either neutral or bad for the virus. And that means that that particular copy of the virus will not propagate further uh, if it's bad. And if it's neutral, it doesn't really matter. And then if it's good, which is the least likely of the three, then uh, good for the virus. I mean, that's probably bad for, <laughs> for us as humans. Then it will... Uh, have a selective advantage and then it can uh, become dominant potentially but generally because they accumulate so, so slowly these changes uh, it's very difficult for the virus to find the more complex changes in the genome that could potentially have a big impact kind of changing the properties quite drastically of the virus so it's quite bad news that we can see these big jumps because that means that the virus is able to also mutate into kind of uh, drastically different forms that requires many more changes at the same time than these kind of slowly accumulated one at a time changes. And I guess if we have these big changes, is that always linked to then reduced vaccine effectiveness or like that it's able to escape natural immunity? That is very interesting. I mean, at the start of the pandemic, the first variants that emerged, the, the alpha, beta and gamma variants, they did have some mutations that were associated with uh, changes in uh, invasive effectiveness and kind of or uh, immune escape overall, you can call it. But most of the of the advantage at that time was kind of increasing transmissibility. So they had certain mutations that made the virus bind stronger to the human cells and therefore entering the cells more effectively, and uh, therefore having a selective advantage was not really immune escape at the time which is not very surprising because the vaccines were just coming out on the market and uh, not such a big proportion of the population was exposed to the virus yet. So it was really not a big deal to have an immune escape property at that time. And uh, the vaccines that are given now, have they changed at all since the ones that were in the beginning? Uh, yes, so the original vaccines that came out in the first uh, kind of iteration of the vaccines, they were based on the original virus that was first detected in, in Wuhan, China. And uh, by the time that the vaccines came to the market, the virus had changed quite a lot from then. And then kind of the process of trying to decide whether to update the vaccine to target more contemporary variants was started. And for flu, we have a very established process for this, where every year the data are reviewed and kind of there, is, there are decisions taken on which uh, variants of the virus to include in the vaccines. And generally there are more than one, var one variant. I mean, you have several variants in the, in the vaccine. SARS-CoV-2, there was no such process established from the beginning, but different vaccine companies started uh, kind of experimenting with introducing uh, other variants in the vaccine. And finally, it came out on the market early this autumn, I would say, or late summer, maybe. I'm not exactly sure on the dates, but then there came out uh, a vaccine that targeted the Omicron variant and the, specifically the BA.5 lineage. That was the most common variant in the world at that time. And I hear there's a lot of different terminology that might be a bit confusing. I hear in ECDC that we're talking sometimes about variants of concern, but there's also variants of interest, variants under monitoring. What's the difference between all these? It, it has been very chaotic kind of uh, with this categorization of variants during the pandemic. I mean, we need to bring some order into the chaos. And the way that we bring the order is that we use these three different categories. And it is not really that a variant of concern, which is kind of the highest level, is, is not really by definition more dangerous than uh, a variant under monitoring. It's mainly a, a kind of a ladder of uh, how well characterized uh, the variant is, how much information do we have, how certain are we that this is going to have an impact. So the variants under monitoring are generally based on uh, our genomic surveillance, where we analyze a lot of uh, uh, viruses from all over the world. Or the individual countries analyze the, the samples and they submit them to a public repository of sequences. And we analyze the sequences to see if there are some variants that are increasing and also have a kind of a genetic uh, fingerprint that makes it probable or kind of a slightly likely at least that it will have an impact. So it, generally if it has a lot of mutations, for example, that might be something that would flag it up. And also if it's increasing in, in proportion somewhere in the world rapidly, that is also a big warning flag. And then, you, then we will categorize that as a variant on the monitoring. And at that stage, we know very little about it. We only know these genomic properties and that is actually increasing. But then flagging it as a variant on the monitoring might trigger kind of further investigations in countries. And then we come to the next stage, the variant of interest, 
And at this stage, there are generally laboratories working on characterizing that specific variant of the virus. And uh, ECDC and, uh, and other agencies might also at this stage undertake uh, risk assessments to try to figure out whether the variant has an impact. So it's kind of an in-between level where we start to, to gather evidence, but we're not yet sure if it will have a big impact or not. And then when we come to the highest level, the variant of concern, this is where the evidence really has accumulated and is pointing in the direction that this is going to have a big impact on the pandemic. We're going to see new waves of cases, for example, or we're going to see a reduction in the effectiveness of vaccines, or we're going to see an increase of the disease severity or a combination of these factors that that will have a big impact and the, the healthcare systems needs to start to prepare for what's coming. Then we come to the, to the VOC stage. And uh, luckily we haven't really classified any new VOCs in almost a year now. VOC variant of concern. Yeah, VOC would be the variant of concern. We haven't classified any such uh, in almost a year now, uh, which is a good thing, of course, and we hope that it will uh, continue this way. Okay, so we're still on the Omicron we are definitely in Omicron territory still. Uh, we are we are investigating a lot of uh, subvariants within Omicron because it's uh, the virus is continuing to evolve, of course, and mutate. But so far, nothing that really really stands out hasn't been detected lately. So we've been going through. I mean, since the start of the pandemic, we've been going through various stages with various variants being the dominant one. Without going into too much detail, could you sort of characterize these stages? Do they have certain characteristics, these variants, and, you know, the way that it affected the world? Is there is it possible for you to go, you know, maybe just give a very short overview of the history of the mutations? Yes. In the first stage, after the virus had emerged in Wuhan, we saw kind of slow gradual evolution, similar to what we are seeing right now. And there was one mutation that seemed to be very beneficial uh, for the virus that emerged very early, the so-called D614G mutation which was talked about a lot in the first summer of the pandemic. And then after this stage, we came into the first wave of the VOC, so the variants of concern. And that was uh, late in 2020 and early 2021, where we saw the emergence of the alpha, beta and gamma variants in different parts of the world, with the alpha variant really being the, the variant that became dominant in Europe. And it was first detected in the United Kingdom. And then we also, slight, a bit after that, we saw the delta variant uh, emerging. And here, it, that variant was really associated with an increased risk for a severe outcome. I remember India was very badly affected by the Delta variant, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. The evidence points towards it emerging in India and having great impact in, in India, of course, on the, on the healthcare systems. That was definitely what happened. There was a little bit of a lack of information. It was very difficult to, to make a rapid risk assessment on the Delta variant early because we were not able to gather information really quickly enough, I would say. And I think after that, many countries stepped up their uh, efforts to kind of early characterize variants to be able to inform these risk assessments a bit bit more rapidly. And then uh, after the Delta variant, uh, we came to the, to the Omicron phase uh, of the pandemic. And this was a game changer for sure. Omicron had so many mutations and many of them affecting immune escape that the previous immunity was not really completely useless, but almost uh, zero against infection, which meant that a large proportion of the population got uh, infected in a very, very short time span. It was also a very transmissible variant. It had many different uh, selective advantages. And it completely took over in a matter of weeks. Uh, It took over completely as a dominant variant. And uh, all other variants have been pretty much eradicated since. Uh, There are sometimes sporadic detections of... uh, pre-Omicron variants, but they are extremely rare now. It's 99.999 or even higher percent Omicron only. Now we have been in this kind of post-Omicron phase for uh, about a year, and we we have seen kind of more of this small-scale evolution within Omicron and not really any big evolutionary jump. So that's really what we're mainly looking out for now to see if there will be further kind of big evolutionary jumps or not after Omicron. Of course, we hope not, and we hope that the that the epidemic will uh, continue to reduce now in intensity in 2023, but you never know what kind of surprises that the virus might have here. I see, yeah. There would be a risk that we could see a new variant that will cause much more severe disease. I guess we always have to be prepared for that scenario. How worried do you think we should be about that? You can never exclude anything, but I think that in the short term it's, it's quite unlikely, actually. The virus doesn't really gain a selective advantage 
by causing severe disease, which is a, which is a good thing. It's it's a good thing about the viral respiratory diseases overall that the virus really benefits from causing quite mild symptoms. It definitely benefits from causing uh, coughing, sneezing, etc. That that helps it to spread, but it doesn't really gain anything from uh, incapacitating uh, the patient because then they will stay at home and uh, probably not infect others. <laughs> so that's a great thing. Uh, but th- there are some more long-term risks that I see. So for example, if the virus uh, infects animals and circulate uh, for a long time in an animal population, then it will evolve in kind of a different direction, which is not related to the human biology at all. Then you can get kind of an elevated risk when it jumps back to humans, if it does, that it can be associated with uh, a more severe disease. And this is a pattern that we see for influenza for sure. Usually the new pandemics are caused by a new zoonotic event where the virus jumps from an animal species to humans, such as pigs from the infamous or famous swine flu pandemic in 2009-10. Exactly. I remember in Denmark, for example, they had to do mass culling of mink because I understand mink is also a type of animal like in where diseases can spread to and from quite easily and, uh, and could be a potential risk factor for this. When you keep minks in a farm, you keep them very, very close together and they're also highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. So it's kind of a perfect environment for the virus to spread rapidly. And then you have this difference in the biology between mink and humans that is a bit of a risk factor because the human, when, when the virus circulates in the human population, it will continuously adapt to the human biology, which generally means that it over time will reduce in uh, disease severity. Although that is not kind of a smooth process, but it, that's the kind of the statistical outcome over long periods of time that the severity will go down. But when it spreads in an animal population, then there is no such driver because of the kind of differences bi- in biology. So it might uh, mutate in a completely different way, and then you get potentially a more severe variant back into the human population. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is there a way then to prevent viruses from mutating? There is no way to really completely prevent them from mutating as long as the uh, biological system is is alive so to say then it will uh, always accumulate mutations Uh, there are however ways to kind of to try to slow the process down and the main way is of course to reduce the case numbers because the probability of mutation occurring is always a function of uh, how many cases that are active at a single point in time but during this pandemic we have seen that there are also probably other factors at play here because we see this big evolutionary jumps that are kind of rare for respiratory viruses. The leading hypothesis for why this is happening is because uh, we think it is because of uh, prolonged infections in immunocompromised patients who are unable to clear the infection. And if they carry the virus for uh, for months or even a year or more, uh, then the virus has kind of more time to interact with the human immune system and uh, has possibility to accumulate many mutations that might be beneficial for the virus. So this is what we believe is the main kind of driver. So one way to try to address that would, of course, be to be very careful with uh, prolonged infections, trying to prevent those cases to spread the virus onwards. It is, of course, very difficult because that would um, require maybe specialized uh, hospital wards, etc. So it's it's, in practice, it's not not very practical, probably. That's one way that uh, uh, you could reduce it. And also this long-term risk of the animal reservoirs of kind of animals spreading the virus within an animal population and back to humans. There I think we need to really perform surveillance in the animal populations to make sure that we know what is going on there in terms of mutations so that we can reduce the risk of uh, of spread between animals and humans in the future. Can you explain just how do you detect new variants? What's the process and the method to do that? Generally genomics methods are used. So um, so there are very advanced instruments that are used to uh, determine the exact sequence of the whole genome of the virus. In the EUEA, there are more than 10,000 samples processed every week for this purpose in various countries. Do you need like a special laboratory for that? You do need a quite an advanced laboratory, yes. First of all, you need a laboratory where you can work with uh, infectious material. So that is a safety laboratory. And then you need this uh, specialized uh, genomic sequencing equipment and staff to handle that. Uh, you need um, bioinformaticians and other data scientists to be able to handle all this data. So it's a quite a large volume of data that has been generated so far in the pandemic. And we, my profession is as a bioinformatician. And uh, in this profession, we work with handling and analyzing this data and trying to, to draw conclusions from them. 
is there like a, a particular volume of testing that you have to perform in order to be sure of the results that you actually have a new variant? That's a little bit of a statistical uh, question. You can view it as as running kind of a mini scientific survey every week, basically, where we try to try to assess if there are new variants emerging and also the proportions of the existing variants. And uh, you can perform kind of statistical calculations to see how many samples you need to analyze to be able to find a variant at a certain stage during its um, kind of rise to success, you can say. And generally, we want countries to sequence so that they're able to detect them quite early. But we, of course, understand there's also kind of a resource question. It's fairly expensive to perform these analyses, and there is always kind of a cost-benefit analysis that has to be made as well. Finally, can you just tell us a bit what ECDC is doing in terms of monitoring and helping to detect new variants? Unfortunately, we don't really have our own laboratory, but rather we rely on the member states in the in the EU to, to provide us with the data. And uh, for SARS-CoV-2, as it's such a global concern, we mainly use databases that are open for the global community so that we can also very easily share the data with WHO and, and other important actors in this field. So the countries, they generate the data in their own laboratories. We also have a contract laboratory at ECDC or several contract laboratories where we can generate data and help countries that do not have uh, their own capacity to generate data. But then, then we gather all this data and we do a, a weekly analysis of all the variants in Europe, but also worldwide to see if there are variants emerging in, in other places. And also it's very fortunate with these global open databases because we don't have to do all the work ourselves either. There are these so-called... Uh, variant hunters that uh, are kind of independent researchers uh, that also monitor the data and uh, really scrutinize the data to a very high degree of accuracy to try to find uh, new variants. We kind of collaborate with these independent researchers through open communication platforms. And then we we compile all this data together at ECDC every week. We make, first of all, an internal uh, report that we use for uh, assessing if there's anything new emerging or anything where we kind of need to change our assessment of a variant. And then we also uh, produce some outward-facing outputs that are publicly available on the ECDC website and included in uh, our now bi-weekly country overview report on SARS-CoV-2, where we both show the epidemiological situation overall for the pandemic, but then also show which of the variants of interest and variants of concern that are uh, are circulating in the EUEA and at which levels you can follow the trends there of, of the different variants. So it's quite useful. So that's what we do. And uh, when we find that we need to perform kind of a more in-depth assessment of a specific variant, so the latest one that really needed an in-depth assessment was the XBB.1.5 variant that seemed to have emerged in the United States, which is now rapidly increasing in Europe and uh, might soon or might already actually be the dominant variant here. That was the latest time we performed such a kind of more in-depth assessment. This variant is still remaining as a variant of interest because it doesn't seem to really cause a huge wave of cases right now, which kind of leads us to not raise it to this highest level, the variant of concern level, uh, but that we have done, of course, many times uh, in the past for other variants that we really assessed as going to have a big impact on, on the pandemic. And then we also communicate, and of course, to all our partners globally. We have a lot of different collaboration partners, of course, like WHO and the European Commission and, and other agencies, and we communicate with them for them to kind of uh, be informed and to take any decisions on uh, measures that that might need to be taken. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric. That was really interesting and uh, informative. So thanks for being with us here on ECDC On Air. Thank you, Niklas. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ECDC On Air. For more information about ECDC and its work, please visit us on the web at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media.